started. Um, my name is uh, John Priest, and I am the um, next speaker. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about uh, plant propagation with emphasis on fruit trees. I don't have a remote, so I'm going to be going back and forth here. But I want to tell you a little bit about myself first. Uh, from 1980 through the end of uh, 2009, for 30 years, I was a horticulture professor at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And uh, I taught general horticulture and plant propagation one spring semester, one fall semester. And in the 30 years I was there, I taught a grad level course, plant growth and development, about 10 or 12 times. And, but my uh, area of research has always been vegetative propagation of woody plants. So when they called me up and they wanted me to talk about drought tolerance, that's not up my bailiwick. So I figure you gotta propagate them before you can kill them. <laughs> so, but I'm the last speaker, so they didn't um, uh, at the beginning of 2010, I became the uh, research leader of the National Clonal Germplasm Repository for tree fruits, nut crops, and grapes, all Mediterranean crops, in uh, Davis, California. And I'm also uh, in charge of a, that's my staff, of a uh, second repository in Parlier, just south of uh, Fresno, and that's mainly a long growing season, mild climate grow out site for the other gene banks. We grow about 1,200 wheats for Aberdeen, Idaho. The only way they could get them to make seeds would be in a greenhouse. So, and we have a collection of drought tolerant crops uh, at Parlier. Now, I guess my bosses didn't think I had enough to do, um, so the research leader of the Citrus and Date Collection in Riverside retired in mid-November, and I've been acting research leader of that repository. So um, I've been in California for five and a half years, and I'm learning where the good restaurants are all over the state. And a lot of them. I agree. It's great. And uh, I'm not going to talk much about the collection, but at Davis, we have the national, most of the national collection of grapes. Uh, we have almonds and all the stone fruits. So we have the peach, apricot, cherry, and plum collections, walnuts and pistachios, olives, figs, pomegranates, persimmons, mulberry, and kiwi fruit. If you're uh, up in Winters, California on, um, on August 22nd at 10 o'clock, we're having a fig and grape tasting. If you want more details, you can contact me about that. But I'm here to talk about plant propagation and to tell you some of the concepts behind it, but to also give you uh, some tricks that we've uh, learned. And um, my philosophy is that if we're going to be propagating plants, we only want to propagate high quality plants. And you'll uh, and uh, these are, this is forest uh, um, pansy, uh, red bud here. These are blackberries, nice and uniform. I'd love to have one of those for my garden. <laughs> uh, there are two ways that you can propagate plants. You can propagate them sexually or asexually. And if we propagate them sexually, that's where we use seeds, or you can actually grow in and take the embryo out and put it in tissue culture and still get it to grow. So these are all uh, seedling walnuts here. But I was at a meeting last summer, and there's a, an older horticulturist, he's in his 80s, but he's just renowned, Jules Janik uh, from Purdue, and he's a historian. And he was giving a talk about some of the history of horticulture. And he was talking about fruit trees because he works with fruit crops. And he had some translation, and this is Jules' interpretation of the translation from 6,000 years ago, where the growers then were saying, 
don't propagate fruit trees by seeds because you only get back crap. That was Jules' word. So I want to show you what happens when you propagate fruit plants by seeds. They're like us. We're heterozygous in our genes. And unless you're uh, identical twins or more, if you look at brothers that have the same parents, and you look at sisters that have the same parents, they kind of look alike. In some families, they don't look even that much alike, but they don't look identical to each other. It's the same with our fruit crops. So this is an interesting part of our collection up in Davis. Uh, the mother of these grapes here is Riesling, a white wine grape, and the father is Cabernet Sauvignon, a red wine grape. And we've got 150 plants that are all siblings. They're all brothers and sisters, and they don't look alike. Don't flower at the same time. Some have white grapes, some have red grapes. Look at the difference in leaf morphology just from those plants. So you don't get Riesling back, you don't get Cabernet Sauvignon back when you go by seeds. These are peach seedlings from Tom Gratzeel's uh, breeding program, and they're showing segregation in their spring flowering. I took it because I thought it was really pretty. So seedlings segregate, they fail to come true, and that's if the parents, if their genes are like us, and heterozygous, and that fits most of our fruit crops. So you can save seeds, someone's got to run last when you get the seeds, you take it home and plant it, and you'll probably get something different. So instead, for six to 10,000 years, we've been propagating our fruit crops and other crops asexually. We've been doing clonal propagation. We make, uh, we make clonal uh, uh, copies of our trees because we want uniformity. We want Cabernet Sauvignon to be Cabernet Sauvignon. I mean, we're, we're pretty passionate about that one, <laughs> right? Yep. But we want Fuji apple or whatever your favorite cultivar is to be that and look like that and taste like that. And so you've got to use vegetative propagation. So what we want for quality is we want uniformity, pathogen free, and also true to type. And uh, this all begins with the propagator. So these are all almonds. This was happening at Duarte Nursery, and uh, they had just budded these. I didn't notice they had an oxalis weed in there. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to tell my students, if you propagate junk, you're going to produce junk. Don't feel sorry for plants. How many of you do? <laughs> you know, yeah. But if you're going to be propagating and you want this plant to grow and produce a good crop for you, you want to start out with the best quality you possibly can. Because if you start out with something lousy, it's going to be weak the whole time. It's not going to produce well. So only select the best. And so vegetative propagation, these are the main ones. I'll be talking about cuttings and layering kind of together. How do we get roots to form? I'll give you a little bit of an overview of plant tissue culture and micropropagation. A lot of um, our fruit tree rootstocks um, were propagated that way. And I will show you some tricks on grafting and budding. And then we can all go home. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start out with uh, cuttings. These, were, these are a uh, Prunus uh, um, rootstock from our breeding program. They, they rooted pretty nicely. And um, I want to talk about two things that people tend to confuse together because one's dependent on the other, but they're under different control. And that is the initiation of roots and then their development. So these have to be some cherries that were produced in tissue culture. And I'm going to be pointing out that, you know, there was a cell here that changed from being a cell that was in a stem to a root cell. That's huge. It's like an arm cell changing and becoming a leg cell and growing a leg out. You know, it's kind of analogous to that. But why did this cell do it but not this one there? 
You know, so the scientists have been wondering about this because we want to get as many roots as we can on these cuttings and, and do as good a job as possible. These are some figs. I'll show you how we rooted these. This is a really low tech uh, uh, way of rooting them. Put them a couple of weeks upside down in some. Um, actually, you can use, um, as long as the hamsters haven't used it, hamster the, the uh, bedding, because that's just uh, um, shaved wood. And uh, a couple of weeks at about 50 degrees, you'll start to get roots, and then you plant them and you're good to go. But why didn't all the cells produce roots? Some of them, at least theoretically, are, have the competency to become roots, and some of them don't. Seems logical, right? Mm -hmm. That the ones that were competent went ahead and became roots. Something signaled them to do that. And the ones that weren't competent just grew as regular stem cells in a stem. I don't like to say stem cells because that has a different connotation. <laughs> Shoot cells, we'll say. So we've got cells in a cutting. And, and to uh, get a root to form, a cell in a cutting, a shoot cell, has to change and become a root cell. So it needs to, either has to already be competent or it has to become competent. And some, like the figs, it's already competent. What signals that a competent cell to become a root? Uh, a hormone called auxin does that. They found that back in the 1930s. They discovered it in 35, but it looked like by 38, uh, Rutone and Hormidin were already on the market. I mean, it's incredible how fast it went from science to something that uh, growers were using. Endolacetic acid is the natural one. We don't use it because if I had a little vial of it here by the end of my talk, it would all be gone because the light breaks it down. So we use endobutyric acid and naphthalene acetic acid because they're more stable. So that's why we usually have to add auxin to cuttings to get the competent cells to become determined and grow into roots. So that step is that root tone? That would be inside of that inside of the cutting, inside of the cells, yeah. Now that's if you already have cells that are ready to receive that signal. But acquired competency, really the only two things that reliably do it are juvenility, and I'll tell you what, we've what I'm talking about that with plants, and then darkness. Darkness is a, uh, an important key to getting rooting to occur. That's one of the reasons that you don't want to root a cutting in a glass of water because light's in there. Put it in a medium, it's in darkness, right? So where are the competent cells? They're usually in the cone of juvenility and um, the oldest part of the plant is the most juvenile and the youngest part of the plant is the most adult, my students would say, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. How could the oldest be the youngest and the youngest be the oldest? That's not what I said. I said the oldest was the most juvenile and the youngest was the most adult. So, uh, a, uh, so here happens to be a beach on my old university campus. And a sign of juvenility is leaf retention in the fall through the winter. And so you can see what the tree looked like when it was a young tree, because that's where all the leaves are. And then up here on this part, it's already shed the leaves because that's an adult trait. So the buds down here were laid down when that tree was a baby. And they retain, not cast in bronze or concrete, but cast in wood, they retain that juvenility. And so I thought, how can I get that across to my students? Then it dawned on me that my mother had a baby book on me. I don't know about your mother, but my mother had a baby book on me, and I'm sure she still has it. She's 88 years old. And she took a little swatch of my hair when I was a baby and put it in the book. It's 
different than my hair now. It's my oldest hair. <laughs> right? It is my oldest hair. I'm 63. It's 63 years old. The hair on my head right now is my youngest hair. Which hair is more adult? Right? So it's the same way to look at a plant. Is that the oldest part is juvenile because it was laid down when it was juvenile. So where do we want to get cuttings? Up here at the top? No. Down at the bottom. So that's where we need on a, on a tree that was originally propagated by seeds. So this is what propagators do. So this is all juvenile down here. We can root, uh, in many cases, and place into tissue culture material from here. They kind of go through a puberty period, like transition. And then there's an adult phase. And then when they go through a seed, they go right back to juvenile. So the genes are just switching on and off is what happens. So what do propagators do? You've got a valuable tree you really like that you want them to propagate it. Can I cut it down? Because if you cut it down, then I can get the shoots to come out of the juvenile part and I can propagate it. So one cut prune at the soil line, uh, a lot of propagators would like to do that to get, get you to, to, um, to propagate it. Uh, there are other techniques. Sometimes they'll hedge to keep juvenile shoots going. Sometimes they'll graft an adult shoot onto a juvenile shoot, let it grow, graft it onto another juvenile rootstock, let it grow, graft it onto another seedling, and do a series of grafts trying to rejuvenate. So, when I was in Southern Illinois in May of 2009, a derecho went through. That's an inland hurricane. We had 80 mile an hour winds sustained for a half hour, snapped telephone poles, <coughs> knocked over this oak tree, knocked down the woods in my house. Um, at my house. Uh, so this was out into a parking lot. It was a black oak. And they went and they cut it down. And I saw that and I thought, that's a thing of beauty. I can propagate those cuttings off that oak tree. Because I'm a propagator. A lot of people say, you know, that's ugly, a tree's falling over. Yeah. I don't understand why that's um, juvenile when it's... The buds that these grew from, how, tall, how old was that oak tree when right. it was this tall? The buds, but the growth itself. Yeah, but the buds stayed there. And, and those genes are set. Just like in the hair in my mother's baby book. And so what grows out of those will go through juvenile for a while and then transition if you let it grow enough and then adult. So they all go through that, but if you go back down into the old part, then you can take advantage of the juvenility. A non pareil almonds, they've had a problem with bud failure in the orchards, and they found that when they've gone back to the 100-year-old ancient trees, propagate from the more juvenile material, it's gone for 30 years, and then it comes back. It's an adult type of thing. So let me, I'll show you some data, but, uh, so uh, we um, actually four shoots from logs. This is off uh, a pistachio branch off, uh, that they're cutting off in the collection. And um, we can get those buds to break and we can use them for propagation purposes. That's just a cut off log. That's a cut off branch, yeah. So rather than cutting down the tree, you can cut off branches. You can cut down the tree too, that works. Um, it works on all, all kinds of, I can probably have done it on 20 or 30, different woody plants. Well, here's persimmon, uh, walnut, mulberry. Um, it, it works well if your logs are at least an inch in diameter and probably about a foot and a half in length. So uh, this may shed a little bit more light on the juvenility. Uh, we got permission from the Forest Service when I was in Southern Illinois to cut down 10 red oaks uh, and actually did 10 white oaks, but it worked better on the red oaks, that's what I'm going to talk about, uh, in the forest to use for research purposes. They're about this size. I don't have any pictures of the trees that we use. So we cut them right down at the soil line. We did five, and then we repeated it and did another five. Can you girdle it or uh, just cut it? it we, yeah, we just, what we did is we just cut it down, 
And then we took the main trunk and we cut it up into 40 centimeter, foot and a half long sections. And we marked each section like the shoots force. And then we harvested the shoots and rooted them as cuttings and looked at their origin. All right, to see what would happen. And so uh, you place the logs horizontally, these have to be pistachios, but it's the same, same thing. And this is, this is what happened on Northern Red Oak. This is from the, this is the rooting we had off the shoots that we got from the lowest foot and a half of that trunk. Wow. When we went up 10 meters, we're way down. This, this uh, predictive equation, I think, shows it better, where we went from 70% rooting, from taking cuttings from the juvenile part, to 17% rooting from the adult part. And look how it falls off as those genes switch off. Go through seeds, they switch back on. It's pretty amazing. Yep. See, plants are yelling at us, they're screaming at us all the time, and, but they're a different life form, and they're hard to figure out. For example, you feed plants with light, not fertilizer. Think about that for a while. So um, here are uh, oak trees uh, in a nursery, and so you know that you could root cuttings from that. Boy, I've always learned that you can't root oak cuttings. But you can if you uh, take them from the right place. So uh, inducing competency by use of darkness. Uh, here is a bundle of fig cuttings that we rooted in the shavings. Uh, and this is, happens to be walnut shoots in tissue culture. Walnuts really tough to root. And they just grow them in darkness to get etiolated shoots to use for rooting. Yeah. Let's say you have an oak tree or any tree, but you don't have a branches. Way up here. How do you get those rootings from down here? I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll answer your question, but I've got a slide to show an experiment that we're doing. Someone mentioned girdling, which would be removing a ring of bark all the way around. We did a partial removal, and um, it did give us some shoots on some, uh, some large walnut trees. We didn't want to <coughs> risk girdling them all the way around, but that is a way that you can get shoes to pull. So what we did is uh, we uh, took our cuttings, we planted them upside down because that was what Jim Doyle had uh, recommended to us, and when I was an undergraduate, I had learned that uh, you can take hardwood cuttings of grapes, this was in New Hampshire by the way, and bury them in the soil upside down all winter, and in the spring you turn them right side up and plant them and they root. So I asked, why upside down, right? Everybody's asking, well, wondering about that. Well, this is New Hampshire, right? It's a little bit warmer up near the surface of the soil than down deep. And so I didn't question it. Probably orientation doesn't matter on these, whether they're upside down or right side up. And so first they'll callus, and then you can get roots. We did it two years in a row. One year we did it, we waited two weeks and got more of this callus and only a few roots. The next year we waited three weeks, got all these roots. We had much better survival with these than with these. So we had root initiation, not root development. And, uh, and as I mentioned, one reason for the rooting medium is to exclude light. So here is layering using some of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, here is the removing a ring of bark. Here's the top of the, the shoot, the, the, the branch up in this direction, the natural hormonal oxen that would break down in my vial of, uh, in front of me, it's all in the darkness inside the bark. It moves down and it accumulates right at the womb. And then they put a medium like sphagnum that's moist around it. I usually will wrap that with plastic and then a foil and a couple of twist ties. And the foil is there to exclude light. So you've got the oxen, we've got the exclusion of light, we've got the moisture. Same concepts that we've been talking about. So um, 
here is uh, out in the uh, walnut collection at Wolfskill uh, in Winters, and uh, we've been producing some disease-resistant walnut rootstocks using the wild relatives in the collection, and we'd like to be able to look at the disease resistance of the mother trees, so we're trying to clone them, and that's not easy. So we're trying this layering on our suckers. And layering is rooting a cutting before you remove it from the mother plant. In that, in that last picture, mm -hmm. uh, back one more. The thickness, are you using moss inside the... Uh, yeah, actually I didn't take this picture when I've done it. I always use milled sphagnum moss, yeah. and I like, that's my bias because sphagnum has a natural fungicidal or fungistatic property, and it gives me that extra protection. It also has one of the best water holding abilities and is well aerated, and I don't worry about the acidity, I get good rooting um, using sphagnum. Better than 50-50 sphagnum and peat? I've only I, 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 I've only used milled sphagnum uh, and have had a lot of success. Most of my layering I did in front of a class, and then I would have them do it. But then I'd bring it in and rip it apart. And I I, I bet I am darn close to 100 percent on layers that I've made. They're they're pretty easy. Yes. When is it best time to do air layering? Um, it depends on the plant. I mean, it really depends on the plant. There's some more tropical plants whenever the knife's sharp, <laughs> you know? Um, and on others, it's, you're going to be wanting to do it during the growing season, usually. Uh, but uh, if, it, it really depends on the plant uh, quite a bit on when you can do that. And the best references to determine that? Folks. I, I would uh, I go uh, online to, to look at that. Um, Hartman and, and Kester's Principles and Practices of Plant Propagation is considered the Bible of plant, plant propagation. There are um, several appendix chapters in the back that will give that. But the best way is to do a search, and, and you'll find it, find it that way, because everyone's going to have a different favorite crop in here that, that they're thinking of. So. So this is Wes Hackett uh, and then Patty who works for us. So here we removed a ring, to, so this goes back to your question. And you can see it stimulates suckering. This was a seedling walnut tree on its own roots. So these are going to be juvenile. Whether we can root them or not remains to be seen, but it stacks the deck in our favor. Then we remove another ring of bark where we layered, took the brown bathroom paper towels that fold that you pull out that you had in school as a kid, uh, cut those into about two or three inch squares, put the um, uh, liquid form of the potassium salt of IBA, uh, and that goes right into solution in water, at 8,000 parts per million, <coughs> wet it up, and then um, put it uh, all around where we uh, remove the ring of bark. And then those spongy rooting uh, plugs that you can get, it's, uh, it's got peat in it, but they've got some petroleum product that makes it more spongy-like. So we slit that, and they hold water, they're meant for plants. Uh, and then wrap that around and tie that with a paper towel. And here you can see all of the, the plugs on the layers. And, and Wes, you just can't hold him down. I think he was 81 at this time. And there's and these actually this actually was the hamster uh, bedding, but it's the, the chips. And then we poured that in there. And there's the hose. And then we uh, water it uh, once a week all summer long. So we did this for timing on the walnuts um, in about May. So it's fairly early in the season, yes. So the IBA, was that applied topically before you put them in the medium, or is it in the medium? It was not in the medium. It was applied to, the, this is paper towel okay. that's wrapped around where this girdle was. Okay. And so the paper towel is dark colored <laughs> because it's wet 
with the IVA solution. So you can see it's light here, and he's wetting it there. So yeah, thanks for clarifying. I I know what the slide's saying, but you guys haven't seen it before. <laughs> and it works. Yeah. Doesn't work on everything, but try rooting walnuts. So this one is especially good in seedling. No, this was an old tree, uh, and it was, it, uh, this was a tree that was probably 30 years old. But why would you do it on that tree? Because um, some of its seedlings are showing resistance to uh, crown gall, agrobacterium, that's the number one problem in walnut orchards, and, and some of them are showing resistance to uh, phytophthora, and we have some that have both. And so that could really, really help the walnut industry through traditional breeding, not GMOs or anything. And so this is one of the mother trees that we want to have copies of because it is, is rootstock. Yep. Yeah, is she, yeah, we're looking, yeah, we're looking for rootstock development. And so is she resistant or not? We don't know that. They want to go into the collection and inoculate my tree, but I'm not going to let them kill it. But we can propagate it, and then they can kill it. What's the time frame for that? Um, this was uh, uh, basically all summer long. So this was 5, 22, or 3 uh, uh, in 2013 uh, when he did the girdles. And this was probably uh, August or so when I was up there. I just happened to be there when he was harvesting them and uh, got the picture. Uh, it depends. Uh, I was a graduate student at the University of Minnesota, and I would air layer Ficus elastica in the winter in the greenhouse. It would take six months for the layer to root. I went to Southern Illinois University, and it happened in a month. So as temperature and climate will also have a huge, and that was the same plant, same clone, uh, um, but in two totally different locations. So, uh, root initiation, we need high temperature and high oxen. Well, maybe 10 to 15 degrees higher temperature in the root zone for the first two weeks or so, or however long that uh, 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 higher initiation takes. I took these pictures, uh, these are woodcuts from Bailey's nursery book. This was his third edition in 1893. And this shows what the old timers were doing, and we can learn a few things from the old timers if you ask me. So here's an oil lamp, here's a water bath, here's sand where they stuck their cuttings and a glass top to hold in the humidity. Bottom people. Here's a convection oven where water was going up and certainly <coughs> I don't know how they put the cuttings in, but it was bottom heat they're going after. Here is a heating pipe in a greenhouse with a little rooting chamber that had soil in it, uh, taking advantage of space. And this is over 100 years ago. And here's a gas fire. And, and modern nursery people think that they have figured out that if you direct stick into the pot, it's a new invention, and you don't have to transplant. Well, these are all directly stuck into pots back in 1893. So even that, they were using back then. So, but if you keep the temperature high, it inhibits the growth of the roots. If your oxen is too high, it inhibits the growth of the roots. So they're under different control. So these were cherries that we had to have in tissue culture. And we, we rooted this one with no oxen at all. And look at how slender and fibrous those roots are. This one just sat there in oxen. And real stubby, short, fat roots, and then a lot of callus there as well. And so if you see that, then that's usually a sign of an oxen overdose, because a lot of people say, well, if a little's good, a whole lot more is going to be better. I gave a talk like this in Hawaii to the tropical fruit growers last September, and, and a grower came up to me and said, I just can't get my any root growth on them. I'll root the cuttings, I put them in the pot, and then I keep dumping oxen on them. Well, you, you'll, 2,4-D is an oxen. 
at 2,4-D will stimulate your ending of cuttings, but it can very easily kill them. And so you want just the right amount to get good roots, but not too much and not repeated applications. So for rooting, we've got to have competent cells. They become determined from the auxin signal. If we can take advantage of juvenility, we're going to get better rooting. Darkness is going to help us. Uh, ringing blocks the auxin, and that's going to help us. And we have a higher auxin and temperature requirement for initiation than elongation. To keep those in mind, that'll help you. I'm going to really quickly go through what they do in a tissue culture because uh, you'll probably be buying tissue culture plants. Uh, there are home kits that you could use if you did ever want to try uh, this technology. So this is clonal micropropagation. It's stimulating branching in some kind of vessel on a defined medium that you can buy as like a prepackaged cake mix or you can make it from scratch. And so they divide the process into five stages. Stage zero is a care of the stock plants. If I weren't in California, I would say, uh, like with these hibiscus that, that we were growing in Illinois, they have to be under cover because you can't clean them up from microbial contamination. But in California, really low humidity, and you can uh, take field grown material and place it into tissue culture. So you can take branches. Tips of branches is what they do that are soft and, and flexible, not woody at all. Remove all the leaves, sterilize it in bleach, and then cut it up into sections, each with a bud, and place those on the defined medium. Yes? I wanted to ask you about that part of it. From what I understand, you know, from people I've learned from, they have it under running water for quite a long time before they put it in the bleach, and with the drought coming on, you know, having it under running tap water for a while becomes more of an issue. I was wondering, just in terms of that home culture kind of thing, if there's a way to do that kind of cleaning that's less water intensive. Yes. Um, I have a, um, a visiting grad student. He's a Sicilian at the University of Palermo, and his professor sent him over to work with me for about uh, nine or ten months on tissue culture. And we just started doing some figs. He got wiped out by microbial contamination. It ends up is from running them under the tap water. We took that out, and they're doing just fine without it. So uh, I don't think that's necessary at all. The reason for running them under the tap water, it's like I planted you. There uh, <laughs> is because it's to avoid this dark exudate that comes out. You know, lots of times when you cut a piece of fruit, you can see that out on, out on the fruit tasting yeah. table. It browns. Those are phenolic compounds that oxidize. It's a protective function, but it's also toxic. So this is pistachio, and so what you do is you make up several vessels of medium. So you're not using gallons of water. You're using you know, uh, much, much less. And then uh, every day for the first week, you just transfer them to a fresh vessel and you can get away from it uh, pretty, pretty easily. Uh, a problem that we have with a lot of our uh, woody plants is these bacteria that hide inside. So they'll be growing well in culture and all of a sudden bacteria start growing up and kill your culture. That's a big problem with pistachios and other fruit crops. But if everything goes well, you'll get some nice new growth uh, inside that culture vessel. Um, you can either get the shoots to multiply or to continue to elongate, and then you just chop them up like that initial piece that I showed you. So that's what it's, it's hard to focus into here. But they're just, they just cut them up into little buds. They grow, and you just keep chopping and slicing and dicing. And um, theoretically, if you get enough labor, you can easily go from one bud to a million plants in a year. Cool. Yes. What is the medium? The um, gelling agent in the medium is auger. But you have to provide everything for these plants. 
So it has to have all of the essential elements, not just N, P, and K. You have to have all of the trace elements in there. Um, because um, you're in a closed vessel and you don't have CO2, you can't rely on photosynthesis. So about 3% <laughs> of the medium is sugar, sucrose. And it's the sugar that makes the bacteria uh, grow. And then there are a few vitamins in there as well. And to get shoots, you put in cytokinin type hormones. To get roots, you do oxids. This uh, is a different color, and that's because of the form of iron that they used. So it's just uh, uh, the soluble form. And that's why it looks rusty. And it's just because of the iron. And so this all has to be done under sterile conditions. Uh, these are in laminar flow hoods that filter out all the bacteria and fungi and everything. And uh, people work uh, in labs and uh, do this uh, and chop up the cultures. This is what blue blueberries, small fruits go great in culture. These are blueberries. And... Uh, so you get to choose the nutrient salts, the plant growth regulator, cytokine and shoot them, and oxins root them. And then uh, once you have enough, then you can uh, um, uh, stimulate them for rooting or the, the tr free transplant stage. You can either root them in culture or what a lot of people do is they induce them in tissue culture. So they'll take the shoots, put them in oxen, medium, and darkness for one week. No roots on them. They transplant real easily. And then they put them out into the greenhouse and they root. So remember, initiation and development are separate processes. And so this happened to be trifoliate orange uh, that uh, they had rooted in culture because you can, there's callus growing at the bottom of that. That's how I can tell that. And here, that the nursery, they're transplanting those. Uh, this is using the etiolation that I talked about to get the rooting. Uh, and these are uh, all walnuts, uh, root stalks, uh, at a commercial nursery here in California. And that's the type of plant that they're uh, producing. Really um, nice, but little plants. A walnut grower is used to planting baseball bat sized trees. They're not used to growing a little tomato plant type. Uh, and these are more like tomato plants. Then the trickiest part can be to try to get them to survive when you take them out of culture. These are all walnut rootstocks in a fog house because it's total 100% humid humidity in that culture vessel. And so you have to uh, gradually get them to adapt. So this happened to be a study we did on hibiscus. This is a leaf that formed in tissue culture. This is a leaf that formed in the mist bench on a plant that came out of tissue culture. And this is a leaf on a um, greenhouse grown plant. They're different. Thinner, thicker, all kinds of air spaces, and tighter. The air spaces seem to help, seem to be problems with losing water. Uh, in addition, the ones in tissue culture don't have much wax on them. This happened to be a different plant. This is carnation, and these are the stomates where they lose water. This one is greenhouse grown. This is on a tissue culture plant. They look different. The hairiness is all waxes. Not there, so it just psh, loses water. It's a, it's a real problem and a challenge. So you have to do it really gradually and um, to get new leaves to form. Uh, this is at North American Plants up in Oregon. Those are raspberries and I would like one of those for my garden <laughs> as well as one of those blackberries. And uh, you can produce really nice quality plants this way. Grafting. I took this picture actually in Albania and um, <laughs> because it was a pear grafted onto a quince and he left the fruit on, on both of them. So grafting is joining together of two plants or plant parts so that they grow as one. And so it requires making the proper cuts. The, the uh, tape on the thumb 
It's not because this grafter cuts themselves off. It gets some protection. But when you're doing that all day and pulling wood, it's tough on your skin. And so you'll see grafters with tape on their hands. I have uh, two women that were grafting for me the other day, and they taped their wedding rings just so it wouldn't get caught on anything uh, when they were grafting. I thought that was a clever idea. I didn't thought of it. Uh, now, when you graft, the most important part of grafting is the inner bark, the part where it touches the wood. And it's usually, a, you see it, it's a little bit darker, a little different uh, a shade of color, and that's the tissue that you have to align between the two parts that you're grafting or it will fail, because this is where the thin strip here is where the vascular cambium is located, and that's what this is supposed to indicate here. And that's where the cells that grow together come from. And if they're not close to each other, then they have too far to travel. So callus grew, here's a bud here, and the callus grew from this bud and from the rootstock and it grew together and it intermingled and made a callus bridge and now it's become woody and then it'll all grow as one because eventually they're going to cut the top off this and this bud will come, become the new top of that plant. So alignment is important. Here you have something with a thick bark and something with a thin bark and if you align the outside of the bark, your graft will fail. So if you look, here's the vascular cambium. So we go around, and it touches the vascular cambium with that. So that's what they're lining up. And you want to have it lining up. The more contact you can get, the better your chances are of the graft uh, taking. So here's what the outside looks like. So if you don't think about it, that doesn't look right. But that is right. And if you pull that back out here, it won't take. So again, look at, look at these. Look at how inserted they are when you have a difference in bark thickness. So you, that's where you have to pay attention. And you get much better contact if you have straight cuts than wavy cuts. Because wavy cuts are going to leave gaps. And that's the art of grafting. If you can make good straight cuts, you've got it. So there's hand-eye coordination. So here's the graft union. So there's a nice straight cut here. It's not that visible. They made a little notch here because it's a whip graft. And then it comes down there. Nice and tight. So that's, that's where the practice comes in. Um, and, and grafting, it's not exactly like playing a musical instrument, but you can understand how the musical instrument works. But if you don't practice it, you're not going to be good at it. And same with grafting. Yeah. What do you think of the Omega grafting tool from Australia? Um, where you get I, that I, I had one, and, and I used to like showing it to my students. Um, when I've heard nurseries give reports on it, they don't get as good a success as when they do it by hand. Really? But um, a lot of people use it. There are other ones that make a wedge rather than the Omega cut. Yeah. And I've seen nurseries that are actually using that. So. Um, it works. Is the omega cut that keyhole shape? Yeah, it's, omega is it's like a U with that flanges out. Yeah. yeah. So so it fits together like a puzzle piece. Yeah. yeah. Nothing like that. It snaps together. Yeah. Well, slides together. So um, another thing you have to do with grafts is they require an airtight seal. If they dry out, they they're going to die. So this is that, uh, it's a, a wound dressing compound, that kind of asphalt sticky base stuff. Uh, this is where they used a grafting tape and totally uh, wrapped this uh, grafted walnut. Um, in many cases they'll use a specially made budding rubbers. And then this is a picture of some grafted uh, coffee seedlings in Hawaii where they use these little clothespin type clips that were actually imported from Japan for grafting vegetables 
for holding the draft union together. So that's just that's a little quicker because you can put that on there a whole lot quicker than wrapping this around. Mm -hmm. Unless you're a professional grafter, and I'll talk about that in a second. So rootstocks. Why use rootstocks? It may be the easiest way to clone the plant. You may get more vigor or dwarfing, depends on what you want. Tolerance of saline, saturated, droughty, or heavy soils, they all different. Uh, increased disease resistance, including nematodes, and increased insect resistance, because we know in California that we graft all of our grapes so we don't get phylloxera on the roots, and that's an insect. And, uh, and that's going to be the top. It's going to determine what your fruit crop is. But it's going to have to be fairly closely related to the rootstock or the graft will fail because there can be incompatibilities. So this kind of looks like a muffin top, a little bit here. Um, and, and usually if they don't grow in girth at the same rate, that is a sign of incompatibility because this bend here is unnatural and can cause problems down the road. Now this is what you don't want to see. So here we have the incompatibility and the rootstock is suckering. That's a sign that something's failing, uh, even though it was grafted a long time ago. Here's one that's just the opposite, uh, where the rootstock grew faster than the sign. This is all in our pistachio collection. I wish I had had this when I was a professor. I had great slides on what not to do. And this just looks like it's plunked on there on this um, incompatible combination. So those are some of the things that you look for. Of course, if it dies, that's also a possibility. This is at Birchill Nursery, and they were budding almonds. And you know they say the hand is faster than the eye? I've never seen anything like it. I was there trying to get pictures, and it would be, boop, and it's done. And he just, it's done with that. And so he said, you know, I'm, so he uh, cut the bud, slipped the bark out, put it down in a teacup, and moved on to the next one, and I couldn't see his hands move. <laughs> so I thought the wrapper who puts the budding rubber on it, I have better luck. She goes, Brooke, and it's done. I, I, so I watched her do at least a half a dozen. I still don't know if she used one or two bunning rubbers. The only, the only way you can see that is go online, find the videos, and sometimes they'll show them in slow motion. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is incredible. The I mean, they're paid piecemeal, but uh, yeah, I, I, there's no way I can really handle it. And so. His is tea budding, so he was cutting a piece like that and slipping out the wood. Sometimes they do or don't. Made a T-shaped cut in the bottom. The bark has to be slipping. That means that it pries away easily from the wood. And then you take this sheath, put it down in here. This is the base of the leaf. This is the leaf of petiole. So it'd be this part of the leaf on this rootstock which you use as a handle and an indicator. If it turns black, it died. If it becomes a nice golden brown, uh, then that's usually a good sign of health. And then you've got the wrapper, and this is where she was, like the camera stopped her hands, but I, my eyes couldn't, and then psh, it's wrapped. <laughs> Uh, this is what it looks like later. This happens to be uh, a cypress here. Uh, and uh, the next spring on the cypress, how the tea bud was healing, you can see the callus growth. And uh, when this bud grows out, because you can see they cut off the top, there'll be a crook. So sometimes people use this U-shaped stake that's called a grow straight, because that's what it does, is it makes the shoot grow up straight, and then you don't have as much of a, of a crook in the bottom. Another type of budding that's, that's very popular in the United States is chip budding, but it wasn't until the 1970s when a propagator from England came over and said that this is the way we should be budding. So here you take a chip of wood out of the rootstock, and you almost make a V-shaped cut in the bottom. 
and then you do the same with your bud and you slip it in there. And um, so here is a chip bud. Notice there's no cambial contact on this side because it's pushed over. It's on that side. So it's better to get one side than neither side. Mm -hmm. So that's a so even though that come in, may look a little off there, it shows me that they did it right. And uh, so um, I've got one person that likes wrapping chip buds with parafilm and one that likes wrapping it with uh, um, budding rubbers. But here you can see that V-shaped cut. Is that done at a different time or can you do it when it's not slipping? You can do this when it's not slipping. Slipping bark is not required. In fact, some nurser, nurseries will often do tea buds if it's slipping and chip bud if it's not. So it gives you another option. That's good to know. And um, they're both about equal skill level um, to, to teach. This is the simplest one to teach, or the simplest one to learn. This happens to be pistachio, and this is a top wedge graft. So on the rootstock, you cut off the top and you split it. And then on the cyan, you make a wedge cut, and you slip it down in there, and then you wrap it. And I could take, uh, I used to use a flowering hibiscus. We'd use a standard red, single red, as the rootstock, and I would pinch them and get like seven branches and they would graft a different color like yellow, purple, double orange uh, on, on the different branches and I could take students that had never grafted and get them to 80 plus percent success with this technique. So this one seems to be the easiest one to learn and it's uh, fairly logical. Uh, there are machine graphs. You asked about the omega graft, which make an omega so it looks like a puzzle piece. This is a different kind of a machine graft where there are, um, we have a saw that made two slots in this one, which gives three pieces of wood, and they just have two here, and then they just get pushed together. And then what we do is we wrap those in peat and we put them in a, in, a, in a box in a room to let them callous for a month or two and then we, um, and then we plant them and the root stock will uh, root during that time of callousing if everything's working correctly. So your pitfalls, uh, these happen to be grafting macadamia nuts by the way, is you want to avoid stressing the cyan, no temperature extremes, remove the leaves or reduce the leaf area, no water stress. If your graft bleeds, it will not heal. It will fail. So that's another problem with bark slipping because often uh, grafts can bleed. So they'll make cuts below into the wood to uh, get the bleeding away from the graft unit. The graft has to be airtight and the vascular cambium of the, contact, of the cyan and the rootstock has to be in contact even after wrapping. Sometimes when you're wrapping, you can knock them off. So, this is my last slide, I think we're just about. So production of quality plants begins with the propagator because that's where it all starts. Like I said, you have to propagate them before you can kill them. So you want to you want to choose your mother plants and the propagules, what you're going to use for propagation from those mother plants carefully, because if you begin with low vigor, disease, or another problem, it's just going to magnify, and you're not going to be happy with the plants that you get. So uh, thank you. And are there any questions? Um, we don't know um, yet um, why um, some plants have competent cells and some don't. But if you think of our Mediterranean ancient fruit crops, grapes, 
pomegranates, olives, and figs. They all root easily. I don't think that's a coincidence. The ancients, when they were picking the quality of the fruit, were also selecting for propagation because if they didn't root, we don't have them, right? It was only the ones that rooted easily are the ones that they brought along. So fortunately, we have that history with some of our crops. But as you're rare fruit growers, you know we've got rare fruits that have not had much work on them. And some of the wild ones really can pose a challenge. Yes. Yes. The chip budding, does it have to be exact match? Well, you say you take out the, the chip of the, uh, of, of your, of it, the sucker or your sign? It's best if you can match diameter, but if you cannot, it does not have to be. You line it up on one side. Just like when they had that pencil thin that they uh, signed their grafting into the big trunk, they could only line that one up on one side. Well, it's going to be the same philosophy with anything. If you have uneven diameters, line it up on one side. If you can get even diameters, then you've got both sides going for you, but better one than none. Yeah. When you cut the uh, trunk of the tree and put the pencils uh, wrapped in, how do you seal the top of the trunk? That was where they, they they tend to use grafting wax, which is a bee wax, beeswax concoction. You have to go back and reapply that one fairly regularly at first because it tends to crack. Whereas the gooey, looks to me like an asphalt based uh, wound dressing, and they actually have one that's a grafting specifically for grafting that's not quite as hard on the plant as some of the wound dressings that will create an airtight seal. So you buy a can and you dab it on with a paintbrush. Yeah. Uh, when you were uh, doing the layering on the walnut, uh, the, the big large trunk, and you were filling it up, it appeared from the photograph like up a couple of feet up yeah. the trunk. And that was for several months. Were you, were you doing any damage to the mother tree? No, the, the mother tree was fine, but it was just to get a, a dark, moist environment down where those plugs were, where we had done the wounding on the layers to get those roots to come out. No, I, I realized yeah. what you know. But no, was... There, there was there was no no harm at all. The reason it was painted white was we did a treatment where we looked at some plant hormones on one side and not on the other, and we just didn't see any clear uh, effect. But clearly, the, the wounding uh, caused the suffering. Well, I was thinking about by putting all that medium in there up a couple of feet, like you had like a basket. I mean, you yep. wouldn't normally want to layer a... It's almost like putting too much mulch under a tree. Yeah, but it's right around there, and when you think on a mature tree, where are the roots? They're, they're out by the drip line, because that's where we're supposed to water and fertilize our trees is out at the drip line. So that's where all your feeder roots are, whereas the roots there, and you just think about trees that you've seen falling over in the woods. The roots by the trunk are great big ones, and they've got a lot of bark on them. So they can take that much better than those nice young white roots where all the metabolism is occurring and all the water and nutrient uptake is occurring. So you don't get crown water? Or no, but I, we're, we're using a very well-drained medium by the, the wood chips. That's what I was asking. We're only, we're only watering it once a week. When we water it, we soak it, but only once a week. And uh, then as soon as we harvest, that's gone. So it's a, it's a temporary thing that's there for two to three months. Yeah. For the wood chips in the lab cuttings, the lab grown cuttings, how wet do you keep those? How often do you water well, them? Well, uh, the ones that were in that the bin that had the yeah. plastic on it, what we did is we just, and it was shavings, shingle yeah, wood, toe is wood what shavings. my greenhouse manager calls it. Uh, they were shavings that we, we, we wet up and made moist. So you couldn't squeeze water out of them but they had that darker color like okay. when they're wet. So they had a nice moisture in them, and by putting, we, we had them out in our pole barn in Davis in the uh, first couple of weeks in March, which would uh, be 
um, a little cooler than right here in March. Yeah. Because you're warmer than us in the winter and cooler than us in the summer. But I, you probably would be okay to do it for a couple of weeks uh, in uh, moist shavings and then get them transplanted. The reason that the ones with the bigger roots didn't transplant well wasn't because of the roots. The buds broke. They were etiolated and they grew down in the darkness and they fried when we, even though we planted and put them under heavy shade under a redwood tree, they still fried.